Hello, and welcome to The Bard's Truth, with your host, The Green Bard. This is The Dire Wolves of Winterfell, episode 4.8, Summer and the Winged Wolf, Unchained. Last time we covered Bran and his fellowships trek north from Winterfell through the Wolf's Wood into the mountains and their meet up with someone Bran believes to be from the Little Clan. This time we'll complete Bran and Summer's story in A Storm of Swords, as they pass beneath the wall. A Storm of Swords, Bran 3. The next chapter is where Summer and Bran see John in the village with the wildlings. It starts with Summer running off to hunt again, but I'm beginning to wonder if Summer is also scouting for the party. It would make sense in two different ways. One, as far as Summer's protective instinct, and two, if Bran decided he was going to warg Summer while they were on the move. Then, while they hide in Queen's Crown Tower, Bran is worried for Summer when they first see a man and then a group of wildlings. Complicating matters, a scared Hodor makes a bunch of noise due to the lightning. Hodor's distress compounds Bran's fear for Summer. Bran briefly contemplates warging Summer to calm him, but after realizing that Hodor wasn't going to stop crying out, he instead uses his skin-changing powers to enter the big man. It scares him, and it should. What Bran does here is one of Hagen's abominations, which we learn about in the prologue to A Dance with Dragons. It is clearly wrong. We get back to this in that volume. It was the first village they had seen since leaving the foothills. Mira had scouted ahead to make certain there was no one lurking amongst the ruins. Sliding in and amongst the oaks and apple trees with her net and spear in hand, she startled three red deer and sent them bounding away through the brush. Summer saw the flash of motion and was after them at once. Bran watched the dire wolf lope off and for a moment wanted nothing so much as to slip his skin and run with him. But Mira was waving for them to come ahead. Reluctantly, he turned away from Summer and urged Hodor on, into the village. Jojen walked with them. Later that chapter, after the man with the horse arrives. Summer's near the village, Bran objected. Summer will be fine, Mira promised. It's only one man on a tired horse. Later that chapter. Dusk was settling by the time the duck and tail were done, and the rain still fell. Bran wondered how far Summer had roamed, and whether he had caught one of the deer. Later that chapter. I hope Summer isn't scared too, Bran thought. The dogs in Winterfell's kennels had always been spooked by thunderstorms, just like Hodor. I should go see him, to calm him. Later that chapter, after the wildlings arrive. Be quiet, Bran said in a shrill, scared voice, reaching up uselessly for Hodor's leg as he crashed past, reaching, reaching. Hodor staggered and closed his mouth. He shook his head slowly from side to side, sank back to the floor, and sat cross-legged. When the thunder boomed, he scarcely seemed to hear it. The four of them sat in the dark tower scarce daring to breathe. Bran, what did you do? Mira whispered. Nothing, Bran shook his head. I don't know. But he did. I reached for him, the way I reached for Summer. He had been Hodor for half a heartbeat. It scared him. To reach is a verb we saw before, with the eagle last episode, and other times as well. It seems to be the verb George R. R. Martin has chosen to show when one of our wargs intentionally starts warging their wolf. It is cleverly mixed with the traditional act of reaching out with one's arm, here with Bran, showing that he didn't fully intend to enter Hodor, but Bran's power is exceptional. With Hodor calmed, Bran again thinks of Summer, deluding himself that he won't be afraid with all the men in the village and the lightning. On the next flash of lightning, the fear in Summer is raw, and he wargs him. The fear in Summer is likely a reflection of Bran's own fear as well. Also, a heightening of Summer's protective instinct for the entire group. Summer's fear doesn't seem to be centered around the thunder, though, but the men. As he scouts the situation, Summer is careful, a callback to his behavior in the much earlier wildling attack with Stiv's band, going wide around the century. After that, Summer senses fear amongst the wildlings. I won't be afraid. He was the Prince of Winterfell, Eddard Stark's son, almost a man grown in a war, too. Not some little baby boy like Rickon. Summer would not be afraid. Most like they're just some umbers, he said. Or they could be knots or norries or flints come down from the mountains. Or even brothers from the Night's Watch. Were they wearing black cloaks, Jojen? Later that chapter. Bran could feel Summer's fear in that bright instant. He closed two eyes and opened a third, and his boy's skin slipped off him like a cloak as he left the tower behind. Later. And found himself out in the rain, his belly full of deer, cringing in the brush as the sky broke and boomed above him. The smell of rotten apples and wet leaves almost drowned out the scent of man, but it was there. He heard the clink and slither of hard skin, saw a man moving under the trees. A man with a stick blundered by, 
a skin pulled up over his head to make him blind and deaf. The wolf went wide around him, behind a dripping thorn bush and beneath the bare branches of an apple tree. He could hear them talking, and there, beneath the scent of rain and leaves and horse, came the sharp red stench of fear. The chapter cuts off before Summer discovers John, but I assume that the protective instinct now extends to John, who is Pack. A Storm of Swords, John 5. Eventually, the protective instinct must get the better of Summer as he attacks in savage fashion, saving John, or at least giving him the opportunity for escape that he'd been watching for. John had no idea which dire wolf it was, only piecing together that it must have been Summer much later. Initially, he thinks it is Grey Wind due to the speed in color, but the description certainly shows that Summer is at least the equal of Rob's wolf as far as lethality in battle. Savage indeed. And death leapt down amongst them. The lightning flash left John night blind, but he glimpsed the hurtling shadow half a heartbeat before he heard the shriek. The first then died as the old man had, blood gushing from his torn throat. Then the light was gone and the shape was spinning away, snarling, and another man went down in the dark. There were curses, shouts, howls of pain. John saw Big Boyle stumble backward and knock down three men behind him. Ghost, he thought, for one mad instant. Ghost leapt the wall. Then the lightning turned the night to day and he saw the wolf standing on Dell's chest, blood running black from his jaws. Gray. He's gray. Later in the chapter. Long hours later, the rain stopped. John found himself alone in the sea of tall black grass. There was a deep, throbbing ache in his right thigh. When he looked down, he was surprised to see an arrow jutting out the back of it. When did that happen? He grabbed hold of the shaft and gave it a tug, but the arrowhead was sunk deep in the meat of his leg and the pain when he pulled on it was excruciating. He tried to think back on the madness at the inn, but all he could remember was the beast, gaunt and gray and terrible. It was too large to be a common wolf, a dire wolf then. It had to be. He had never seen an animal move so fast, like a gray wind. Could Rob have returned to the north? He's obviously wrong about gray wind being there, as Rob and his wolf were headed to the Red Wedding at the time. John thinks of this encounter twice more, which we'll cover later. A Storm of Swords, Brand 4. Moving on, Bran thinks about how he and Summer had a disturbing dream, which obviously was about the Red Wedding. I imagine that this dream had something to do with Grey Wind's perspective on the Red Wedding. Either way, Bran knows after the dream that Rob and Grey Wind are dead. It is unclear if they are aware of Catalan's status, making it much more likely that the dream was from Grey Wind. He wouldn't know of Catalan's fate because Rob and their bond died first so there would be no way for Grey Wind to witness her fate. No, thought Bran, it is the night fort, and this is the end of the world. In the mountains, all he could think of was reaching the wall and finding the three-eyed crow. But now that they were here, he was filled with fears. The dream he'd had, the dream Summer had had. No, I mustn't think about that dream. He had not even told the reeds, though Mira at least seemed to sense that something was wrong. If he never talked of it, maybe he could forget he ever dreamed it, and that it wouldn't have happened. And Rob and Grey Wind would still be? Bran has come a long way since Maester Lewin almost convinced him that his dream about Lord Eddard's death was not true. He attempts to deny this, but with no conviction, he knows it's true. At the next mention of Summer, they have arrived at the Night Fort, and Bran is still deeply fearful. He is already thinking about the Rat Cook and Old Nan's other scary stories. Then he mentions how Summer is even ill at ease. This is a clear example, in my opinion, of Summer mirroring Bran's emotions, though certainly he could be sensing some of the magic of the wall as well. Bran forced himself to look around. The morning was cold but bright, the sun shining down from a hard blue sky, but he did not like the noises. The wind made a nervous whistling sound as it shivered through the broken towers. The keeps groaned and settled, and he could hear rats scrabbling under the floor of the great hall, the rat cook's children running from their father. The yards were small forests where spindly trees rubbed their bare branches together and dead leaves scuttled like roaches across patches of old snow. There were trees growing where the stables had been, and a twisted white weirwood pushing up through the gaping hole in the roof of the domed kitchen. Even summer was not at ease here. Bran slipped inside his skin, just for an instant, to get the smell of the place. He did not like that, either. In the next passage, we find out that summer knew John got away. The fact that Bran thinks about John so much is another indication of Bran's humanity and his empathy. We then learn that in saving John, Summer was gravely injured. We learn a bit about the bond here as well. 
The pain Summer feels is so strong that Bran cannot even maintain or reestablish their connection. He is relegated to praying for Summer's safety, throwing in a prayer for Jon Snow. Fortunately, Summer returns and they are able to dress his wounds, which heal. Bran considers his prayers to have been answered. But by whom? Or was there no intervention at all? Either way, this is a clear example of our theme of separation. The gate the night fort guarded had been sealed since the day the Black Brothers had loaded up their mules and garrons and departed for Deep Lake. Its iron portcullis lowered. The chains that raised it carried off. The tunnel packed with stone and rubble all frozen together until they were as impenetrable as the wall itself. We should have followed John, Bran said when he saw it. He thought of his bastard brother often since the night that Summer had watched him ride off through the storm. We should have found the King's Road and gone to Castle Black. Later. But there are wild links. They killed some men and they wanted to kill John too. Jojen, there were a hundred of them. So you said. We are four. You helped your brother, if that was him in truth. But it almost cost you Summer. I know, said Bran miserably. The dire wolf had killed three of them, maybe more, but there had been too many. When they formed a tight ring around the tall, earless men, He had tried to slip away through the rain, but one of their arrows had come flashing after him, and the sudden stab of pain had driven Bran out of the wolf's skin and back into his own. After the storm had finally died, they had huddled in the dark without a fire, talking in whispers if they talked at all, listening to Hodor's heavy breathing and wondering if the wildlings might try to cross the lake in the morning. Bran had reached out for summer time and time again, but the pain he found drove him back the way a red-hot kettle makes you pull your hand back even when you mean to grab it. Only Hodor slept that night, muttering, Hodor, Hodor, as he tossed and turned. Bran was terrified that Summer was off dying in the darkness. Please, you old gods, he prayed. You took Winterfell, and my father, and my legs. Please don't take Summer, too. And watch over Jon Snow, too. And make the wildlings go away. No weirwoods grew on that stony island in the lake. Yet somehow the old gods must have heard. The wildlings took their sweet time about departing the next morning, stripping the bodies of the dead and the old man they'd killed, even pulling a few fish from the lake. And there was a scary moment when one of them found the causeway and started to walk out. But the path turned and they didn't, and two of them nearly drowned before the others pulled them out. The tall bald man yelled at them, his words echoing across the water in some tongue that even Jojen did not know. And a little while later, they gathered up their shields and spears and marched off north by east, the same way that John had gone. Bran wanted to leave, too, to look for summer, but the reeds said no. We will stay another night, said Jojen. Put some leagues between us and the wildlings. You don't want to meet them again, do you? Late in the afternoon, Summer returned from wherever he'd been hiding, dragging his back leg. He ate parts of the bodies in the inn, driving off the crows, then swam out to the island. Mira had drawn the broken arrow from his leg and rubbed the wound with juice of some plants she found growing around the base of the tower. The dire wolf was still limping, but a little less each day, it seemed to Bran. The gods had heard. The next passages are more examples of our themes, including Summer's sense of danger, shadowing slash protecting, hunting, and mirroring. Bran continues to be afraid of the characters from Old Nan's stories, and Summer continues to be on guard. So they went exploring. Jojen Reed leading, Bran in his basket on Hodor's back, Summer paddling by their side. Once the dire wolf bolted through a dark door and returned a moment later with a gray rat between his teeth. The rat cook, Bran thought. But it was the wrong color, and only as big as a cat. The rat cook was white, and almost as huge as a sow. Later. Sometimes Summer would hear sounds that Bran seemed deaf to, or bare his teeth at nothing, the fur on the back of his neck bristling. But the rat cook never put in an appearance, nor the 79 sentinels, nor Mad Axe. Bran was much relieved. Maybe it is only a ruined empty castle. Later. She left and sent Hodor out to gather wood. Summer went too. It was almost dark by then, and the dire wolf wanted to hunt. In coming full circle, that last bit reminds us of the danger of being separated. That night, Bran hears Sam's party ascending the stairs from the Black Gate, but he thinks the worst. The thing that came in the night. Another of Old Nan's stories. With Summer out hunting, Bran assumes he's too far away to help, so he again uses his power to take control of Hodor, this time for a significant period of time. He knows it's wrong. He feels Hodor's fear and tastes vomit. Yet he justifies it as necessary for safety, because Summer was so far away. 
As it turns out, Summer wasn't that far. He shows himself not long after Sam is subdued by Mira. Bran did nothing productive in Hodor's skin either. Bran may have been drawn to Hodor's skin partially because he so wants to feel an able body. Summer, for his own part, must have sensed Bran's terror and returned quickly. But he sensed no danger from Sam, obviously. Still, this episode shows how strong Bran is getting. Bran was too frightened to shout. The fire had burned down to a few faint embers and his friends were all asleep. He almost slipped his skin and reached out for his wolf, but Summer might be miles away. He couldn't leave his friends helpless in the dark to face whatever was coming up out of the well. I told them not to come here, he thought miserably. I told them there were ghosts. I told them we should go to Castle Black. Later. She kept to the shadows as she moved, stepped around the shaft of moonlight as quiet as a cat. Bran was watching her all the while, and even he could barely see the faint sheen of her spear. I can't let her fight the thing alone, he thought. Summer was far away, but... He slipped his skin and reached for Hodor. It was not like sliding into summer. That was so easy now that Bran hardly thought of it. This was harder, like trying to pull a left boot on your right foot. It fit all wrong, and the boot was scared too. The boot didn't know what was happening. The boot was pushing the foot away. He tasted vomit in the back of Hodor's throat, and that was almost enough to make him flee. Instead, he squirmed and shoved, sat up, gathered his legs under him, his huge strong legs, and rose. I'm standing. He took a step. I'm walking. It was such a strange feeling that he almost fell. He could see himself on the cold stone floor, a little broken thing, but he wasn't broken now. He grabbed Hodor's long sword. The breathing was as loud as a blacksmith's bellows. Later. John's here, Bran said. Summer saw him. He was with some wildlings, but they killed a man and John took his horse and escaped. I bet he went to Castle Black. Sam turned his big eyes on Mira. You're certain it was John? You saw him? I'm Mira, Mira said with a smile. Summer is. A shadow detached itself from the broken dome above and leapt down through the moonlight. Even with his injured leg, the wolf landed as light and quiet as a snowfall. The girl Gilly made a frightened sound and clutched her babe so hard against her that it began to cry again. He won't hurt you, Bran said. That's Summer. John said you all had wolves. Sam pulled off a glove. I know, ghost. He held out a shaky hand the fingers white and soft and fat as little sausages. Summer padded closer, sniffed them, and gave the hand a lick. As they go down the well and through the black gate, Summer is back to the role of protecting slash shadowing. Summer circled the well, sniffing. He paused by the top step and looked back at Bran. He wants to go. Later. I'll go first. I know the way. Sam hesitated at the top. There's just so many steps. He sighed before he started down. Jojen followed then Summer, then Hodor, with Bran riding on his back. Mira took the rear, with her spear and net in hand. Later. Then pass, the door said. Its lips opened, wide and wider and wider still, until nothing at all remained but a great gaping mouth and a ring of wrinkles. Sam stepped aside and waved Jojen through ahead of him. Summer followed, sniffing as he went. And then it was Bran's turn. Hodor ducked, but not low enough. The door's upper lip brushed softly against the top of Bran's head and a drop of water fell on him and ran slowly down his nose. It was strangely warm and salty as a tear. As an aside, nothing in this encounter with Sam shows him to be a craven, save maybe when he was attacked by Mira. Note also that the water coming off the top of the gate is salty. This gives rise to my own tinfoil, my first Reddit post, about the wall being made of seawater, not freshwater ice. It's called An Engineer's Perspective on the Wall, if you want to look it up. A Storm of Swords, John 8. As this volume comes to a close, we return to John, who has finally realized that it was Summer who saved him, not Grey Wind. Sadly, he knows Rob is dead, believes Bran dead, and is worried that Summer died saving him. The bond between the two boys is built upon the mutual empathy we saw in the first chapter of Game of Thrones. It continues into A Dance with Dragons. They are Peck. Ghost, where are you? Was he dead as well? Was that what his dream meant? The bloody wolf in the crypts? But the wolf in the dream had been gray, not white. Gray, like Bran's wolf. Had the Thens hunted him down and killed him after Queen's Crown? If so, Bran was lost to him for good and all. That was the final mention of Summer, though not by name, in A Storm of Swords. In this volume, Bran, unchained by his acceptance of his nature as a warg, has grown in his powers immensely. 
His quick growth and unease when Summer is away turns dark with the use of the power over Hodor. Summer is injured in an attempt to save John from a band of wildlings while Bran is warging him. This embodies Summer's protective nature and sense of danger. These themes, coupled with Bran's empathy, their collective independence, though with Bran now in control, and the strength of the bond to the pack, remain central to Summer and Bran's story. While we are reminded that bad things can happen when the dire wolves are separated from their Stark children. That's it for A Storm of Swords. See you next time for A Dance with Dragons with two more Bran and Summer episodes. Thanks to all the terrific artists who let me use their work on this YouTube video. Thanks especially to those in my family who helped in this series so far. Enjoy this content, you can also consider supporting us on Patreon.